I still remember when we were young and fragile then No one gave a shit about us Cause time's tough for them Feels so good yeah. Cruising the hood yeah. Straight to the real world Rich kids never understood But I don't care I can fade away to anywhere I don't stop Cause you're Hi Ken, it's Super Saturday And since it is April April is National Poetry Month, and uh, this may be a video you'll have to set aside for like another time. It might be a little long. And as you can see, I got some of my poetry books here, which I've acquired through the years of either buying them or borrowing them. Borrowing them. I'm going to read you a few passages from some authors you may know and then some authors you may not know, just to you know change it up, keep it interesting. And then I'm going to read a little bit of my stuff, just to throw it in and wrap it all up. So, to begin with, we start with a quote from Faust, which was written by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. And it talks about uh, a guy named Faust making a deal with the devil, and that's where the term comes from, deal with the devil. And his deal with the devil is to get... All the information in the world, pretty much, and trade that in for his soul, so he can be the smartest man in the world. And the quote is, I am the spirit that negates, and rightfully so, for all that comes to be deserves to perish wretchedly, for there better nothing would begin, thus everything that your terms sin, destruction, evil represent, this is my proper element. Next we have Edgar Allan Poe, and um... I know he's known for his kind of creepy writing, but he actually has written some really beautiful poems. And this is one of the more popular ones, too. It's called Annabelle Lee. It was many and many year ago, in a kingdom by the sea, that a maiden lived there, whom you may know by the name of Annabelle Lee. And this maiden, she lived with no other thought than to love me and be loved by me. I was a child and she was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was more than love, I and my Annabel Lee, with a love that wings the seraphs of heaven, coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out a cloud chilling my beautiful Annabel Lee, so that her high-born kinsmen came and bore her away from me, to shut her up in a sepulchre in this kingdom by the sea. The angel, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea, that the wind came out of the cloud by night, chilling and killing my Annabel Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than love, of those who were older than we, of far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above, nor the demons down under the sea, can ever dissever my soul from soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. For the moon never beams, without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I feel the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so all the night tide I lie down by the side of my darling, my darling, my life and my bride, in a supper cool there by the sea, and her tomb by the sounding sea. Now basically it's kind of a Romeo and Juliet kind of story where they're young and he's in love, but she's promised to another man, and basically he's fighting for her and she ends up dying so he's still in love with her and he still visits her in her tomb by the sea it's still kinda dark but it's kinda like darkly beautiful and I like that kinda stuff this is a book I got from a book sale in the basement of the library as you can tell it's a little beat up just a little bit but I'm gonna read this and then I'm gonna tell you who wrote this um, this is one of my favorite poets and maybe you'll understand why it went many years, but at last came a knock, and I thought of the door, with no lock to lock. I blew out the light, it tiptoed the floor, and raised both hands in prayer to the door. But the knock came again, my window was wide. I climbed on the sill and descended outside. Back over the sill I bade a come in, to whatever the knock at the door may have been. So at a knock I emptied my cage to hide in the world and alter with age. And that was written by Robert Frost. And the beautiful thing about this is... It talks about how he's trapped in his room and he's afraid to take on opportunities that are knocking on his door, literally. But instead of 
letting them in, he escapes them, and he wants to go and do his own thing. So he goes and hides in the world instead of just a room. It's kind of ironic how he's hiding in the whole world and not just a room. And I just, I love his writing. It's good stuff. Now this next one is written, is a selection from Dante Alighieri, who wrote The Divine Comedy, but this isn't from The Divine Comedy. This is from another book called the called Vita Nuova, which in Italian means new life, and I'm sure I butchered that pronunciation. I don't know how much you know about Dante, because I know me and you are both reading um, Inferno by Dan Brown, and they kind of explain a little bit of his history, and I briefly told you about it in a couple videos ago. Well, he really loved this girl named Beatrice, and... Uh, she didn't really return his love. And uh, unlike the video game, Dante's Inferno, they were never actually together. She was married, she went and married another guy, and they were good friends. But basically he was writing poetry about her from afar. And it's almost stalkerish, but I've been in that place. And I'm sure a lot of guys who are watching this have been in that place. And uh, what he's writing is so beautiful about this girl who doesn't return his affection that he has for her. At least the same way that he has. And um, he wrote about her as he continued to live his life into his exile. And he wrote, what I'm going to read you is a selection from the, the Vita Nuova, where he's talking about how he thinks she will die. And he says, A lady youthful and piteous, greatly graced with human gentleness, who was there when I called to death, seeing my eyes full of pity, and listened to my empty words, was moved by fear to intense weeping, and other ladies who were made aware of my state by her who wept with me made her go away, and pressed about me to comfort me. One said, do not sleep, and one said, why are you troubled, that I left off my strange fantasy calling out the name of my lady. Now that was just a little sample, and it goes on for several stanzas, and uh, unlike the Divine Comedy, it's not just cantos, it's, it's different sonnets, it's, it's a collection of different styles of poetry, and he really shows how he is a true poet, and he doesn't follow one form. Hi Jack, you gonna come help me read? Next I have a book that my friend RJ Feller gave me and is the uh, Selected Poems of Byron, Keats, and Shelley. And honestly, I am not a big fan of this writing. And in fact, the selection I'm gonna read to you is from a song. And reading this is honestly kind of like reading the Bible. It's a lot of poems about God, and it's just, I'm not that interested. Like, my favorite passages from the Bible come from the Psalms. And I love the songs in the Psalms themselves. And uh, the selection from this book that I'm reading from is actually a song that Lord Byron wrote. And it's just simply titled, Stanzas for Music. And it says, They say that hope is happiness, but genuine love must prize the past. And memory wakes the thoughts that bless. They, they rose the first, they set the last. And all that memory loves the most was once our only hope to be. And all that hope adored and lost hath melted into memory. Alas, it is delusion all. The future cheats us from afar. Nor can we be what we recall, nor dare we think on what we are. And the Shelley that is mentioned on this book, by the way, is the same Shelley that Mary Shelley was married to, Percy Shelley. And it was funny because he stole her away after she was already married. Ah, Victorian times. Now, just like the last book I was reading, this isn't necessarily one of my favorite authors. It's William Shakespeare. And it's just one of those things among poets where you have to touch on it, even though it's not the best thing. And I remember talking to my librarian, Kim Beaumont, at my high school when I was still in high school and uh, she kinda like gave me a rundown of different
questions. She gave me a rundown of different questions, and she asked me like what my personality is, and based off my personality, she picked Othello for me to read by William Shakespeare because she said that best fits my personality. It would be something I would like to read because she knew the kind of books I like to read. That's what I liked about her. She was an awesome librarian, and I that's one of the other reasons I still wish I was in high school. Like most of Shakespeare's work, it is a tragedy. I don't know why all his tragedies are really popular. I think his comedies are awesome. The thing I hate about Shakespeare is not only is the language the hardest part about it, like the story is fine. I could read an abridged version of this and read it just fine. But even the abridged versions of the story, it's so many twists and turns and it's just like, Jesus Christ, am I reading a soap opera or a fucking play? Basically, Othello is like this captain in an army. And this takes place in Venice. And um, Iago is his like first mate officer below him. Basically, his kind of servant guy. And uh, he doesn't like that Othello has, you know, given this other guy, Cassio, a higher rank advancement in this military. So he is like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones, and he's just plotting and using everything to turn everyone on everyone. And um, there's this big love triangle between Othello and his wife, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce her name, but I'll probably read it here. And um, basically, Iago is found a handkerchief that like made their relationship really special, Othello and his wife. And uh, he put it in this other guy's house and made it look like she was cheating on him. So he went and told Othello, and now Othello is filled with rage, and they're planning to go kill her. And this is just a selection from that part. Hang her, I, this is Othello. Hang her, I do but say what she is, so delicate with her needle. An admirable musician, oh, she will sing the savages out of a bear of so high and plenteous wit and invention. And Iago says, she is worse for all this. And Othello says, oh, a thousand times, a thousand times. And then so of gentle condition, I too gentle. Nay, that is certain, but yet pity of it. Iago, oh, Iago, the pity of it, Iago. And Iago says, if you are so fond over her inequity, give her patent to offend. For if it touched not you, it comes near nobody. And Othello says, I will chop her into messes, cuckold me. And Iago says, oh, tis foul in her, with mine officer. Yeah, so, what they're saying here is, she's been caught with this other guy that's in his ranks. So, Othello says, with mine officer, and Iago says, that's even fouler. Saying, like, that's even worse. That she, one, she's cheating on you, two, it's with someone in your own ranks. And Othello says, Get me some poison, Iago. This night I will not expostulate with her, lest her body and her beauty unprovide my mind again this night, Iago. And Iago says, Do it not with poison. Strangle her in bed, even the bed she hath contaminated. And Othello says, Good, good. The justice of it pleases. Very good. They go on to kill people. Oh, Shakespeare. Coming down to the last three parts. Hang in there. Now, this is a selection from Charles Bukowski, who I briefly touched on before. And this is from his actual poetry. And this is one of my favorite poems of all time. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I am too tough for him. I say, stay in there. I'm not going to let anybody see you. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I pour whiskey on him and inhale cigarette smoke. And the whores and the bartenders and the grocery clerks never know he's in there. There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out, but I'm too tough for him, I say. Stay down. Do you want to mess me up? Do you want to screw up the works? Do you want to blow my book sales in Europe? There's a bluebird in my heart that wants to get out. But I am too clever. I only let him out at night sometimes, when everybody's asleep. I say, I know that you're there, so don't be sad. Then I put him back, but he's singing a little in there, and I haven't quite let him die. And we sleep together like that, with a secret pact, and it's nice enough to make a man weep. I don't weep. Do you? And the penultimate poem comes from David McWayne, of course. Couldn't do a whole poetry thing without David McWayne. 
for Dave McWayne. I think it would be awkward to meet him in person and call him David McWayne, because I always refer to him as his full name. And then I watch videos of him with Big D in the kids' table, and they always call him Dave, and I'm just like, I'm weird. I'm sorry, Dave. If I tag you, in, I'm sorry, Dave. And this is called, What Is This All? <clears throat> Readers moan that writers of today will never be as poetically adverse, or as dirt-chomping descriptive, or have the stories worth reading, or be able to live lives worth writing about. Like Hemingway, Kerouac, Vonnegut, or Bukowski. Viewing ill-fated lives as a number of one credential for one's favorite author to me is a scream. I see it as the most posh process of judging a book by its cover. Can't you just see that? Can't you just see all the highbrow scholars gazing into bars, rancid alleys, dungeon apartments, at the downcast writers munching on stale peanuts, rotting cheese, moldy bread, or fruit, stating aloud as to sound like American royalty? Look, Cassie dear. Look at how the poor alcoholic degenerate writes such beautiful stories. We are all poets. We are all adventurers. We just need someone to show us that our keys to our cells are in our pockets. There is no reason to stand still and only read of expeditions of the soul. To see yourself live the dream you dream, only in your mind. To see yourselves on excursions to places where, to where pillows and perfumes are not essentials, but that is not known by all, and there must be messages sent out to remind the malleable. To free the forgetful, it is a trick to live and write about life, to hand a bound gift to others who are too scared to live. It is a trick to see, hear, taste, and feel, pocketing adjectives, and then write descriptions for others' imaginations to see, for others' canines to bite into, for others' instincts to flare, for those who don't look outside their cells. Is there guilt in living? Am I a messenger, a Paul Revere of what's out there, of what's too far out for the lighthouse to illuminate over the sea of curiosity? Is it a crime to tell everyone that there is more to life than their HBO series? More adventure than the movie theaters, malls, and Red Sox games can, provi can provide? These are not derelicts that live and write. No, the poets just desire what still lives in us all, the instinct to live. Or am I wrong? Or am I too far down this well that there is no reason to turn around? And lastly, we have the little black book of my little writings. This is kind of a funny little writing I wrote, but here it goes. I see you in that picture. You seem happy enveloped in red. I could only look for so long, and then I am filled with sad dread. You are so far, but close to me. Confessions of old in my mind. I miss a girl with golden brown hair. Only thoughts can turn back time. I'm jealous. I worry about you. My fingertips on your soft little chin. Beside ourselves in a dark room, in the grass, my lips meet yours with a grin. A started portrait, but you stole the paint. My sister of song and ticklish mystery, a night of betrayal in sight of many eyes. A necklace that represents all of our history. My dear, you never told me. Your mother embraces me at the end of the day. And you came and saw me, leaving your lover for a day. And I, whispering loud over the music and fireworks, whispered to your ears. Too bad I have a girlfriend. Well, Kent, that's all I have for today. And uh, I hope the weather's been nice up there. It's been really nice today. I was out playing some Ultimate with Shane and Nick. And uh, I hope this didn't bore you completely to death. And uh, happy National Poetry Month. And I'll see you tomorrow. And for tomorrow's topic, I would like for you to just do some readings from some of your favorite books. It doesn't have to be poetry. Just read me some selections from a few of your favorite books and talk about why you like those, those selections and those parts of the book so much. Easy, simple. I'll see you tomorrow. Would it come for me? I'm sitting at my desk with a gun in my hand wearing a bulletproof vest. In my, 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 have a time